Why do most video game movies suck? As someone that would consider themselves to be part of the gamer community, also known as someone that knows all of the words to the Donkey Kong rap from Donkey Kong 64, Okay! I think I'd be speaking to the choir here when I talk about the collective groan that the internet lets out when a studio announces another film adaptation of a video game IP. God, Chris Pratt's behind me, isn't he? Hello! Don't get me wrong, I love films, and I love video games. Pong, great game, spend like an hour on the final boss. But for some reason, when those two things are combined, it just kind of becomes like, uh... Oh. Like a poo vending machine. But why does this happen? Who's to blame here? It's not like film adaptations have never been done before. J.K. Rowling is looking like Scrooge McDuck with how much goddamn money she's making off the Harry Potter series. And she proves that by being an absolute nutcase on Twitter. They even made a film adaptation about Legos, which are plastic blocks and also the most dangerous thing to exist on a carpet besides Vietnam era punji sticks. So why do these video game adaptations fail almost specifically? I've been thinking about this a little bit and I wanna try to explain what I think. I'm not just gonna be talking about exclusively terrible video game movies because I think that they've actually been getting better. I created this graph here that averages out the audience rating of video game movies on Rotten Tomatoes for every year that one or more came out and it seems like they're improving. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys two awful little stinky videos game movies that show what not to do and then I'm gonna talk about one of the wins that we had in recent years and what I feel like studios should be doing so let's start off by talking about the Mario movie and by that I mean the one from 1993 okay Something changed on May 28th, 1993. The live-action Super Mario Bros. movie was released and let me tell you it did not look like this it looked like this Oh. And it did not go well. It grossed about 20 million in the box office, about half of what was spent to make it. And if studio executives weren't already worried about how well a video game movie adaptation would fare in comparison to something like a book, for instance, they would soon learn a month later with the release of Jurassic Park. This was the very first Hollywood movie that was based on a video game property, and it really set the tone for how things would be going in the future. So allow me to give you a short summary of this movie. Hang on tight. The movie starts off with giving some lore from 65 million years ago, where a meteoroid crashes into the Earth, killing off the dinosaurs and also splitting the universe into two parallel dimensions. Now, I don't know how many alternate dimensions were created on the moon, but based on the craters, there's probably a lot. The dinosaurs that survived crossed into this new dimension and evolved into a humanoid race and founded the city of dino -Hatton. Then we see some lore from 20 years ago where a woman leaves a big old fucking egg along with a rock at a Catholic orphanage. As she tries to leave, President Koopa, who is the equivalent of what you would know as Bowser, catches her and demands to know the location of the rock. Where's the rock? The lady dies from some rocks falling on her and the egg hatches and it's got a baby inside of it. In the present, you got our boys Mario and Luigi who are working as plumbers in Brooklyn, New York, but they're about to be run out of business by this mafia operated construction company run by this man, Anthony Scapelli. Luigi falls in love with this NYU student, Daisy, who, spoiler alert, is the baby at the beginning, and she's digging under the Brooklyn Bridge for dinosaur bones. Anthony Scapelli is also threatening these NYU students who are at this dig site because I guess they're messing up plans he has for his business, but that's just how they do it in Brooklyn, so uh, fuck off. They go on a date and Daisy brings Luigi to the bridge to show him what they're working on, only to find some of Scapelli's henchmen sabotaging the dig site by busting open some water pipes. Mario and Luigi fix the pipes, but Iggy and Spike, Bowser's henchmen, and also the wet bandits from Home Alone, give them brain damage and kidnap Daisy. When they wake up, the brothers pursue them through an interdimensional portal to Dino Hatton. <laughs> Dino Hatton is like this dingy, wet, dystopian version of New York City with fucking mean old ladies and cars that kind of operate like trains in some ways, and Bowser is the dictator of this city. Basically, the reason why Iggy and Spike wanted to kidnap Daisy is because she's the long-lost princess from this other dimension, and Bowser wanted her rock, which is actually a meteorite fragment, so he can merge this world with the human world and become dictator of both. Bowser has this ridiculous device that has the ability to evolve and devolve creatures, which in turn allows him to use it against people who defy him and turn them into Goombas. And they don't look like that, they look like this. 
Jesus, that, that is a Goomba in this movie. Bowser uses this device to make Iggy and Spike smarter so that they can more effectively catch Mario and Luigi, but it just makes them, one, verbally pedantic. Excuse me, that hardly seems logical, does it? Perhaps we should stay and formulate our own strategy. Tete -tete. And two, smart enough to realize that Bowser is in the wrong and they join Mario and Luigi. This entire situation culminates with Bowser's jealous wife, Lena, merging the worlds with the meteorite fragment and fucking dying from its energy. Bowser devolves Capelli into a chimpanzee because that's evolutionarily accurate. And also, what's a good movie without a monkey moment? <laughs> Monkey! Then Daisy removes the fragment from the meteoroid and the worlds separate again. Mario and Luigi fire devolution guns at Bowser and blast him with a bomb arm, and then he turns into kind of a T-Rex, I think? But they kill him by turning him into primeval goo. What even is that? They win. Daisy stays in Dino Hatton for whatever reason. Mario and Luigi become heroes, and when the story of all of this reaches the news, they're dubbed as the Super Mario Bros. The end. Wow. An obvious takeaway that anyone who has played the Mario games would get from this movie is that it's a terrible representation of it. It doesn't look anything like it. But one of the first thoughts that I had when I was doing research was, oh, well, it's 1993. There probably wasn't too many Mario games out at this time. Maybe the writers didn't think that the world was fleshed out enough that they could make something substantial with what was provided to them. Unfortunately, Mario Bros, Super Mario Bros, Super Mario Bros 2, Super Mario Bros 3, Super Mario Land, Dr. Mario, and of course, Mario Teaches Typing had already come out at this point. Which begs the question, holy crap, why did they do this? And it turns out the answer is that the directors wanted the movie to be the true story of Mario, and then the games are an inaccurate parody of what really happened, which is insane. The idea was that we were going to tell the real story and that the game itself was a perversion of the original story which the movie is. And I would say that this illustrates one of the most glaring examples of what is wrong with video game movies these days, which is you can't control the world building we already established. In the world of Mario, you have these Italian plumbers named Mario and Luigi who are navigating through this bright and colorful world, shooting fireballs at Troopas and Goombas, fighting for the goddamn life in those water levels, and eventually saving the princess from Bowser. In the world of the 1993 Mario movie, you have two Italian plumbers named Mario and Luigi who are navigating through this dark and depressing dystopian nightmare city from another dimension populated by evolved dinosaurs surviving through car chases, going to clubs, and killing their enemies by turning them into primeval goo. It's a bit different. On top of that, you have many references to the game and characters, but they're all drastically different from the game. Namely, Bowser, Iggy and Spike. Toad is this musician that is protesting Bowser's rule and as punishment, Bowser devolves him into a Goomba. Also, Goomba. I'm never gonna get over this. A remarkable creative decision to make this shrunken headed beast a thing. Yoshi makes an appearance and he is legitimately just a velociraptor. There's this woman at first who was an enemy to Mario and Luigi, but then she turns out to be an ally because she danced with Mario. And she actually was a reference to this red fish. Who would have known that? The only true visually similar reference that exists in this movie is the bomb arm. That's all they gave us. This sort of drastic change in what a target audience is expecting to see in the movie, AKA fans of the game, is what causes backlash like this. If you wanna make a successful video game movie, you have to satisfy the expectations of the audience who already know what the movie should generally look like. Because chances are, they know it better than you do, especially if you don't know the video game. When asked why so many of the characters in the movie were so drastically different from their video game counterparts, director Rocky Morton answered with this. I wanted to find a reason to free myself from the game, and the reason I came up with was that this was the original story and everything else was a distortion from this. With that concept, it freed me from being shackled to any portrayal of the video game. Why? Why would you do that? 95% of any executive when they approve the idea of a video game movie are doing it because they're seeing the millions and millions of dollars that the IP is making in sales. They understand how popular the game is and they're playing it safe with the studio's money by investing in something that has already been proven to have worked. The same thing happens with film adaptations that come from books. So why they would then change everything about it for the movie confuses the hell out of me. And the best part about it is that there was an original script that was basically a lift from the original series 
and they scrapped it. On top of that, apparently the experience while filming the movie was a nightmare in itself. Bob Hoskins and John Leguizano were getting drunk on the set while filming just so they could get through it. Apparently the actual soundstage that the Dino Hatton set existed on would get excruciatingly hot. Dennis Hopper threw an absolute baby rage for like 45 minutes at one point because of all the script changes that were happening. Sometimes the day that they were supposed to film the scene, sometimes, sometimes like 10 minutes before they were supposed to film the scene, which meant like hundreds of extras just had to stand around in this blisteringly hot set just fucking miserable it sounded like an absolute roller coaster of the ride and the movie itself is a roller coaster yeah. before talking about the next movie though let me tell you about today's sponsor which is bespoke post a monthly membership club delivering boxes of top shelf goods from under the radar brands that's free to join they purchase 90 percent of the products in the boxes from small businesses many of them based here in the us of a every month they introduce their members to new products we're talking outdoor gear barware clothing you name it. their lineup is constantly changing every month based on your preferences you'll get a box assigned to you and you can get a preview before it's shipped if you want to swap it for a different box or even skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. What I got from Bespoke Post was the Weekender bag, which is a great bag for a short trip, and this cocktail smoking and infusion kit. I did not know that something this high class was even legal. I already used the Weekender bag for a trip I went on last week, and it's very nicely made. It's super sturdy, it's got a reinforced frame, and it looks freaking great. Look how cool I look. To get 20% off your first box, go to the link in the description and use code TED20 at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com slash TED20. So with all that being said, let's fast forward 12 years later to 2005's Doom. Multiple generations of gamers have experience with the Doom series, and I think all of them would agree to this statement. Killing demons is fun, Please give me demons to kill. I want to shoot the one with the big eyeball because he's freaky and he's got to go. Doom can be cited as responsible for exploding the first person shooter genre, even to the point where games that came after that were first person shooters were referred to as Doom clones. Due to the popularity of such a series, I can almost guarantee you that every movie exec was getting cummy in their pants thinking about how much moolah they could make off of this fucking Doom series. Oh my God. The movie stars Roseman Pike, Carl Urban, and Fortnite character Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and it bombed at the box office. So allow me to give you an even briefer summary of this movie. In 2046, 85 personnel at the Union Aerospace Corporation, also known as UAC on Mars, are attacked by an unknown assailant. Following a distress call sent by Dr. Carmack, a squad of eight Marines, you can tell they're Marines because the rock has a giant Semper Fi tattoo across his back, are sent to the research facility to figure out what the heck is going on. You've got Sarge, Duke, Goat, Destroyer, Mac, a rookie they just call Kid and Reaper. They're sent on a search and destroy mission with the UAC only concerned with them retrieving data from the station. The Marines use a teleportation device called the Ark to reach Mars. And when they arrive at Mars, they're met by UAC employee Pinky and Reaper's twin sister, Dr. Sam Grimm, who they go to retrieve the data with. They find out the UAC has been researching skeletons they've discovered of a humanoid race that was genetically enhanced with another 24th chromosome pair. They find Dr. Carmack and he's fucking crazy and also holding someone else's hand and bring him to a medical lab for treatment, but he disappears like a little gremlin. Then all of a sudden they start getting attacked by these freaky unknown creatures left and right and they're tracking them all over the place trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Many of the Marines are killed along the way because it's dark and they're in space. And that's how it works in these movies after Alien came out. It isn't until they cut open one of the creatures that they discover that they're actually humans. What? What's going on here? That's weird. They learn that the UAC was experimenting on humans using that extra chromosome pair they found, but one of the mutants got loose and started fucking everybody up. Now the rock is mad and he wants to kill every last single person that's been infected by this. But Reaper and Dr. Sam find out that not every single person that gets infected turns into a gooey little weirdo. Some of them retain their humanity and become superhuman, I guess? Only those with a predisposition for violent or psychotic behavior will become creatures, which is a dicey premise, I have to say. Some of the gooey boys escape and they reach Earth where they slaughter or mutate the staff over there. And when the surviving Marines show up, the rock orders them to literally kill everyone. When Kid refuses to slaughter a janitor's closet full of innocent people, The Rock shoots him in the face for insubordination. They get attacked again by the creatures, and when Reaper gets wounded, Sam injects him with the extra pair of chromosomes, and he becomes a superhuman, and it starts this first-person shooter section of the movie where he's killing all the mutated humans. The movie ends with a standoff between The Rock, who has become infected but in the bad way, and Reaper. They have this big old fight where they're jumping on stuff and punching each other, and it ends with Reaper tossing 
tossing the rock through the arc with a grenade and blowing him up. Then Reaper and his sister return to the surface at Earth. The end. At first glance, this kind of comes off as your average sci-fi in space movie where something goes wrong and then they have to fight creatures in dark hallways. Until you remember, holy shit, this movie was supposed to be about doom, wasn't it? Where, where the hell are the demons? Where's the one-eyed guy? I miss him. He's cute. And that's one of the primary problems with Doom as a video game movie because they changed the world building that we already established. In the original story of Doom, it's about the UAC doing some sketchy experimentation on teleportation technology. And then all of a sudden, demons start coming out of the portal and it's the player's job to kill every single last hell fucking sucking dick wiping <laughs> fucking hell spawn he sees. In this iteration of Doom, you've got Marines fighting off what in reality it was just some like messed up experiment gone wrong scenario. They made small references to the religious themes in the game essentially chalked up to characters praying in between the times that they're getting killed by these mutated humans and you've got a well-intentioned reference in this first person shooter scene where reaper starts kicking ass through the uac facility with the monsters at this point actually looking like the ones from the game you've got the hell knights and even pinky when he's mutated i think is a reference to like doom 3 but this almost comes too late because this is stuff that happens in the last 20 minutes of the film where was that in the rest of the movie plus in this version of the UAC, teleportation wasn't even an issue at all. That shit was working like they had that on lockdown already. Which is such a weird choice given it was the catalyst of the original story. These changes in the writing of the story illustrate another point to why I think video game movies fail. And that is the misguided perception that I think a lot of movie executives have which is Hollywood is a legitimizer and they know best. For a long time, there's been this perception from the older generation that video games are these campy, half-baked creations that mainly serve as a toy for kids and don't carry much legitimacy as a medium. Video games have long been viewed as a waste of time, something that rots your brain, makes kids violent, as opposed to something, you know, I don't know, far less traumatizing, like uh, religion. You see this in the confusion of people to understand how esports could be a legitimate industry as opposed to something from the real world, like golf. And in the case of video game movies, I think that there's a subtle situation going on where the writers, directors, executives, whoever's at the creative helm is looking at the material that they have to work with and that it's their responsibility to improve it. After all, they've made all these movies in the past, so they know what works. Right? There's an interesting mixture going on between an executive's bias towards spending money in the safest way possible, because if the movie bombs, that's a really public, embarrassing thing for their career. And sometimes a bias from directors who feel from their perspective as an auteur or whatever, that they have this unique vision that will surely improve the IP for the better. These are all problems that are wrapped up in the financial and egotistical aspects of Hollywood. And those issues are prevalent enough that they miss one of the most important things that a video game movie should be doing, which is accurately representing the video game and understanding why people enjoyed the game in the first place. One of the biggest things that I want to emphasize is that these terrible video game movies were not necessarily terrible movies. They're just terrible at representing the video game IP that bears the weight of their entire marketing campaign. They fail to understand where the original piece of work came from, what it meant to fans, and that the inherent value in a repurposed IP is not as simple as slapping a name on it and tossing some A-list actors on the roster. And it's also not the responsibility of a video game movie to 100% abide by every single plot point that occurs in a video game because they're different mediums. But when you're removing the demons from Doom and then you're taking Goombas and you turn them into these, you start to run into some issues. When I think about these two movies on their own though, without any expectation for the movie to provide any sort of satisfaction on the video game that it's marketed after, they improve a little bit. Super Mario Bros. becomes this wild film about two brothers that are just thrust into this insanely dystopian and otherworldly environment. The sets themselves are incredibly detailed. The costume design is crazy. And even though the directors were a bit misguided in the creation of this movie, they definitely achieved what they set out to make, which is a fucked up perverted version of Mario. If they renamed it to something like interdimensional plumbers take on fucking dinosaur humans that are just as bad at destroying the environment as we are, they're just like us. It probably would have been a cult classic. I don't have as much praise for the original Doom movie. If you were to strip away the IP from the movie itself, it would likely do a better job existing as just one of those sci-fi shoot 'em up brain empty movies where you just watch it after eating a 400 milligram edible. But that's about it. <laughs> 
as we've seen in this graph I've created, weatherman mode, generally the audience perception of video game movies is improving. I hope I'm doing this right. In recent memory, we have films like the second Angry Birds movie, Detective Pikachu for God dang sake, but the monster of them all with a whopping 93% audience approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a seal of approval from Sonic superfan Connor Eats Pants is none other than 2020's Sonic the Hedgehog. There's a lot to say about this video game movie, but I'll start with this. This movie set the record for the biggest opening weekend for a video game film in the United States and Canada and grossed $320 million worldwide. It made triple of what they spent on it. And many of the choices that are made in the creation of this film are what I think studios need to be thinking about. Starting with the most obvious situation, the redesign. Oh no. When Paramount Pictures dropped the original Sonic the Hedgehog movie trailer, the internet pretty much imploded upon itself and spawned an unstoppable demon of rage that would not let Jeff Fowler sleep at night until something was done. This was the original design of Sonic the Hedgehog, as I'm sure some of you are aware. And the movie was mocked, rightfully so. They tried to turn Sonic the Hedgehog into a kindergartner that had been tarred and feathered and dyed blue. His teeth were shockingly human-like, and his proportions made him look like a person wearing a tight fitted fursuit. It was awful. And as a result of this, probably one of the smartest moves made happened during this period, and it absolutely saved this movie. They pushed back the release date by almost an entire year, and they redesigned Sonic. For the first time ever, I think, at least in the case of video game movies, we witnessed a shattering of the fallacy that Hollywood knows best. Animator Max Schneider revealed in a now deleted interview with an Argentinian Sonic website that Paramount Pictures was content with the first design because it gelled with the live action actors and the world. Oh yeah, of course, he is a blue hedgehog that can speak English and run at 300 miles per hour. There is no realism to be obtained here. Making cartoon movies too realistic is off-putting to all parties involved. It's off-putting to the people who are unaware of the series because they're like, what the fuck is that? I don't even know what that is. And it's off-putting to lovers of the original game because they're like, what the hell have you done to my blue son? You've turned him into the coke-addicted half-brother of Splinter from the live-action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Which was also creepy and big surprise made by Paramount five years before. From what I've read, one of the biggest contributors to saving this movie through the redesign was graphic novel illustrator Tyson Hess, who was brought on as a lead artist to redesign Sonic. Apparently he's like an OG in the Sonic community, and in hiring him, Paramount made an incredible shift in their approach because when hit with criticism, they listened to the audience. But that's not the only win that Sonic the Hedgehog had. Sonic the Hedgehog did a really good job of creating a story that actually respected the character that Sonic originally was, which is basically a goofy and witty blue hedgehog that can run fast and whose main antagonist is an equally ridiculous Dr. Eggman. That's part of one of the greatest things that Sonic does in its writing. It's not afraid to lean into the cartoony aspect that the IP has. They managed to actually write Sonic and the human characters he interacts with into full-fledged characters with goals. Beyond that, there's some really smart integrations of references into this film. The original planet that Sonic comes from is straight up the Green Hill Zone from the games with the loop-de-loops and everything. I think it does a wonderful job of placing the world of Sonic we know within this universe in a pretty smooth manner. You've got the Sonic rings, which in the games are just a means to get health as an actual important item within the story that are a means of inter- planetary travel. And the final battle between Sonic and Dr. Eggman is like this elevated version of a Sonic game boss fight. With Jim Carrey and his floating machine he designed and Sonic utilizing actual moves he would do in the game to defeat him. They even included that goddamn terrible Sonic drawing meme in this movie. And if nothing else sold you up until this point, that should. But the final reason that I think this film works so well, especially in terms of story, is because I don't think that anyone really knows what the actual canon lore of Sonic is. Because in doing research for this video, I tried to figure it out. There are like seven different continuities of the Sonic story. You've got the games, you got the cartoons, there's even Sonic comic books, apparently. I spent like an hour trying to figure out the story of Sonic and I still don't know. Apparently at one point, Eggman blew up the moon and then later on the moon was back to normal and their explanation was that the moon 
turned around. And in the case of creating a film for Sonic, that probably worked to their advantage. As long as they included all the defining characteristics of what made Sonic, Sonic, along with his antagonists, their personalities, the way they looked, and it matched up with what fans already understood, then they can have a little bit of liberty with the story because it's so goddamn convoluted. In the end, they did a really good job and they set the standard for how to operate when developing a movie of this variety. Also funny enough, I'm recording this video the day before Sonic 2 comes out. And if I were to do a little bit of comparison of what the critics were reviewing and what the Sonic ended up getting an audience and apply that to the Sonic one, I think it's going to do about the same, if not better. Sonic boom! In terms of the future of video game movies, I think it's safe to say that we are going to continue on this streak of improvement. The present day video game industry is larger than it's ever been. On top of that, the people who understand video games and have played them are now the same people that are getting old enough to be heading projects for these multi-million dollar blockbuster movies. That's not to say that we won't be receiving below average video game movies in the future. I'm sure that there's going to be some Call of Duty movie that comes out and nobody's going to figure out why it was made. Listen to the community. Hire experts who understand the IP better than anyone, preferably people also in the community. And always remember, it's not your world to mess with. And if you do, it'll probably fuck you. Bye-bye.